villages of Madhukare for many years. For 335 families that once relied on impure water, there's some hope. A water purification project by Gammatta. Gammatta, for the people, by the people. News First, Newsline. A very good evening and welcome. This is a news line on News First for the News First team. I am Jaima Ratnayaka. This evening we are here to talk about a very interesting topic. Today, the 13th of July, was supposed to be a very pivotal and interesting day for Sri Lanka. However, the events that transpired earlier on in the day proved uh, different from what the masses expected. However, to dissect the day's proceedings, we have with us today Dr. Pakya Soti Saravanamuttu. He is the Executive Director of the Centre for Policy Alternatives and not a stranger to the show either. Thank you very much, Doctor, for joining us. Thank you. Doctor, let's get straight to the point. Today was supposed to be the day President Gotabi Rajapaksa resigned following uh, the chaos that ensued on the 9th of mm -hmm. July. However, that is not what has happened until now. We do not know. There are a few more hours left until the day ends. However, as things stand, the president of this country is still Gotabe Rajpaksa. However, something interesting did happen where the speaker came to the media and announced that President Gotabe Rajapaksa has taken a leave of absence and has invoked Article 37.1 of the Constitution where he has appointed Ranil Vikramasinghe, the Prime Minister, as the acting president of this country. So, Doctor, let me speak to you on Article 37. Article 37 provides for the president to appoint the acting president. However, the Constitution is silent about how long an acting president can stay or remain in that seat. How do you view this? Because there is a school of thought, Doctor, that Ranil Vikramasinghe is, has been a proxy for the Rajapaksas uh, over the years. Against that backdrop, how do you view this? Well, I suppose there's a constitutional lacuna in terms of how long you can have an acting president for. But the point is, is that he has been legally appointed the acting president and hopefully the letter of resignation from Gotabe Rajpaksa will be announced at some point mm. today as promised and therefore Parliament can get in on the act and move towards the election of a president to serve out Gotabe Rajpaksa's uh, remaining years mm. in office. So that is pivotal. I think the whole, the, the key thing that has to happen mm. is that the letter of resignation has to come in and Parliament then gets moving. Hmm. So, in terms of uh, the Constitution, the Constitution governs us all. However, the President has used Article 37.1 to appoint Ranil Vikramasinghe against the will of the people, I must say, supposedly, uh, as the acting President. And today we saw more scuffles breaking out, more protests happening and people broke into or breached the Prime Minister's office. So there is more chaos mm -hmm. ensuing as a result of this decision. Why is this happening, Doctor? Do they not see that Sri Lanka needs a sustainable solution for its woes? Yeah, one would have hoped, given that Ranil Vikramasinghe has said that once an interim government is set up, mm. that he will resign. Mm. One would have hoped that they would have been given the next couple of days until the 20th, which is the date that the president is the new president is supposed to be elected, mm. that you know we would have had a period of calm. But it's very clear that the Aragalaya sees Ranil Vikramasinghe as part of the political class that has to be got rid of, mm. and therefore they do not want to see him in office. They say he is unelected, he is uh, unrepresentative, he is illegitimate, he is all of those things. So. In that sense, I suppose the appointment of Ranil Vikramasinghe then tends to feed various conspiracy theories that he has been put there as a proxy of the Rajpaksas, like when he was appointed Prime Minister, that he is there to give the Rajpaksas uh, 
saving safe passage, passage, mm. safe passage, uh, a breathing space, whatever. Yeah. So do you believe the political limbo that Sri Lanka is in is detrimental to the negotiations between the IMF, uh, sourcing bridge financing options? How will our lenders or potential lenders view this political crisis because there seems to be no end in sight. How do we address that? Absolutely. I mean, this is what I would always say is that this is a crisis of governance. Mm. And in order for the economic side to be taken care of, we first need political stability. We need a government that is representative of the people, that the people trust, they have confidence in and therefore that government can deal with the external world as it were. So dealing with the IMF would require the degree of political stability, the requisite degree of political stability before we can commit ourselves to the staff agreement where we have to agree on what the points, the aspects of the economic framework is going to be for the restructuring program. We need the same stability to engage with the um, people in the market where we have to discuss the whole questions of a haircut and all of that mm. with regard to our debt restructuring. Mm. So political stability is absolutely key. Mm. Speaking of political stability, Doctor, how would you view the best case scenario for Sri Lanka to get out of this mess that we are in currently? No. So therefore the letter from the President comes, the Speaker acts on it. Mm. He then becomes acting president, or if Ranil Vikramasinghe is still presi acting president, Pre president yes. Ranil Vikramasinghe continues as president, and then we have the election hmm. for the new president hmm. who will serve out the rest of Gotabe Rajapaksa's term. Hmm. Once that is done, then we have to get a prime minister, we have to get a cabinet, and I think one of the first things that the new government should do is a say that they will abolish the executive presidency probably go and uh, get uh, Ranjit Madhuma Bandara's uh, 21st amendment uh, proposal and say that we'll vote on it and then you need a referendum of course so two-thirds majority and a referendum and then you set a date for the general election the referendum for the executive presidency can be held on the same day as you have the general election However, there still seems to be no decision on the part of the opposition or the government to reach a common consensus. Why do you think that negotiations or discussions have stalled? Well, I mean, I think, well, I don't know the precise reasons in every case, but this jockeying for power mm. is something, is precisely what the Argale, what the people have seen, and they have seen it to be to the detriment of the interests of the country and that must stop. There must be some people amongst the 225 of the members of parliament who can discern a national interest mm. and try to live up to it. Otherwise we're absolutely sunk. You know, so if we get to a general election, which I hope we do soon, hopefully we'll have new entrants into the political scene. People in the Aragale must also decide as to whether they are going to join existing political parties or whether they are going to form political parties of their own. But that new, that infusion of fresh ideas, of creative thinking, all of that has to happen or else we are really on the road right to the bottom. Speaking of a new system of governance, the Aragale came about as a result of the people wanting a system change. They wanted the political system in the country that has festered for so long and has corrupt this country to change. However, in 2019, they did the exact same thing, expecting a system change by voting in President Gota Viraj Paksa because he was not a career politician. And yet, here we are today amidst the worst economic crisis in Sri Lanka. So do you still believe that is the best way to go? Yes, I think it is the best way to go insofar as you need to get new ideas, new people, etc. But yes, experience and expertise is important. If you look at Gotabe Rajpaksa, what was his experience in governance? He was in the army, maybe a part of a brigade. And then he was defense secretary under his most powerful brother, who was the president of the executive president of Sri Lanka. Mm. So he had an extremely limited experience as far as governance was concerned. And so, for example, he decides overnight that you move from chemical agricultural fertilizer to organic fertilizer. You know, he gives a command and he expects it to be carried out. Executed. You mm. can't do politics that way. 
However, let's continue to talk about uh, democracy and uh, strengthening institutions. The 20th Amendment gave the President sweeping powers and one would say that parliamentary powers were curtailed. However, if a 21st Amendment is brought forward and a new constitution is formed in the future, how would the Parliament be empowered? How can the Parliament be empowered and the powers of the President be limited or curtailed? So can you run the, me through that? The limiting, the curtailing of the powers of the President will then move to the Prime Minister. Mm. And of course the Prime Minister is beholden to a majority in Parliament. Mm. And he can be got rid of, he or she can be got rid of by a vote of no confidence. Mm -hmm. There's always that ultimate check with regard to it. The other point of course is, is that the idea is that the state authorities, mm. they will be appointed by the Constitutional Council and they will therefore be immunized hopefully from political interference which is what has happened so far. Now I think the Madhuma Bandara proposals also talk about a sort of people's council or assembly almost like a senate, but not exactly a senate, where policy initiatives and all of that will be tested with them before they're brought to parliament and passed into law. So there will be a greater inclusivity and representativeness with regard to the lawmaking process in the country where it does not therefore depend on the whims and fancies and the favoritism of one single individual, i.e. the executive president. So the Constitutional Council too will be responsible for the appointment of key individuals. Mm. And I think they also call for the appointment of the governor of the central bank to be put in the constitution as well. Let's talk about the international community's view of Sri Lanka at present. We know that uh, foreign media outlets are here in Sri Lanka. They have been reporting aggressively about the crisis. All eyes are on us, basically. How will this affect us? How will their view to the international community of Sri Lanka's crisis affect our opportunities of uh, coming out of this crisis and reaching out to other nations for assistance? It will affect us in every single way, in terms of foreign investment, in terms of our exports, in terms of tourism, everything will be affected in terms of the reportage of what is governance, what is rule of law, what is law and order like in this country called uh, Sri Lanka. And in the immediate situation, of course, we require their assistance with regard to the bridging finance before an IMF agreement kicks in. And therefore, political stability is tremendously important. We need something, I think, like three and a half to five billion to see us through. Hmm. Then in addition to that, of course, we have to deal with the IMF to get the debt restructuring and our international creditors, as I said to you earlier, uh, to move on the debt restructuring. And so we therefore have to present the most positive outlook and give evidence for that, that we are serious and committed to getting back on our feet. So, so in, in, I mean, you know, adverse uh, foreign uh, reporting on Sri Lanka, however truthful it is, it's going to have severe consequences for our reputation internationally. Let's switch our attention towards Sri Lanka's economy. Uh, the political crisis came about as a result of the economic crisis and the people could not bear any more because inflation skyrocketed to about 113 percent according to uh, foreign analysts, yeah. one might say. So how do we get out of this rut, doctor? How do we create a sustainable economy in Sri Lanka? We've always been on the ledge. We've never been a secure nation economically, uh, at least in the recent past. How do you view that? I think, you know, apart from the politicians and all of that, I think what has happened is, is that there is a culture of entitlement in the country where you get free education, you get free health, you get a job in the public service, mm. and you're taken care of in effect from cradle to grave. We have 1.5 million or whatever on the public service payroll for a population of 22 million. We have state-owned enterprises which are making losses, millions by the day. We have a taxation system that Gothabe Rajpaksa cut the tax base and so we lost what 600 to 800 billion, billion rupees mm. uh, to the treasury. Mm. So you know we are also an aging population yeah, and uh, we have 52% of our population are females. We have 
the bulk of our employed in the informal sector, not in the formal sector. We need root and branch reform of the economy in terms of cutting the public sector. Cutting the public sector in terms of those people, in terms of new intake, and in terms of those who are there, we can function with more than less, less than half the amount, I think, that we have. We have to get rid of those state-owned enterprises that are making so many losses. Mm. We have to increase taxes. But we have to do all of those things without putting a disproportionate burden on the poorest of the poor. And that's why the social welfare network is going to be tremendously important in our negotiations with the IMF. Yeah. Right. We are engaged in a very insightful conversation with Dr. Pakisoti Saravamuttu, who is the Executive Director of the Centre for Policy Alternatives. However, we have to cross over for a short commercial break. We will be right back on the other side. No, no. News First, Newsline. What has President Gota Raj Paksa communicated to the Speaker? Prime Minister appointed Acting President. Protests in the Maldives. Prime Minister's office breached by the public. News First, Newsline. Welcome back to Newsline on TV1. We are in conversation with Dr. Pakya Soti Saravamuttu. He is the Executive Director of the Centre for Policy Alternatives. Doctor, we spoke about the economy, we spoke about the political crisis, we spoke about many things uh, during the programme. I want to, to divert your attention to the political arena once more and speak to you about forming an interim government, an all-party government that uh, that has been that word has been thrown around a lot, mm. but still, parties are yet to reach a consensus. How do you weave an ideal all-party government? Who should be the president? Who should be the prime minister? And how can the cabinet be formed? Well, I think I mean you know the, the classic answer to this would be that you know the more suitable person should be elected the president and. He must then elect someone who commands the confidence of the House, mm. nominate someone who commands the confidence of the House to be the Prime Minister, and then also the, re the respective ministers. Mm. I think it needs to be an all-party government in the sense that we are in the deepest, direst crisis that we've ever faced. And therefore, there has to be some sense of national unity, of a national consensus as to how we get out of it. And given that we're talking here about an interim government that is preparing mm. the country to move towards that path of recovery, I think all parties should be part of it. Mm. And we should get that consensus that the executive presidency should be abolished and that we go to a general election in which no one can turn around and say, no one can get on the streets or take over a public office or whatever it is and say that you're illegitimate. That new government will have a fresh mandate from the people. That new government will also have been one in which the people have voted in a referendum where they say, yes, we do not want the executive presidency anymore. Mm. We want a parliamentary form of government. So it has to be one that is inclusive and representative mm. and therefore legitimate. However, there has been a question surrounding having an election saying that Sri Lanka doesn't have the necessary funds to uh, to afford an election at present. They say we need around 600 billion to hold a general election and that we can't source it therefore an election cannot be held. Isn't that taking away the democratic right of the people? Well I mean I don't think I don't really necessarily buy their argument that we don't have the money the central bank can print the money to have an election. The central bank has done that for a lot less uh, Good on the reasons. line. Yes, mm. exactly. So I don't see why you can't do that. Okay. Let's uh, continue to talk about the, the political impasse that we are in. Why? Let's talk about the opposition's role, Doctor. Um, when they were invited to take up the post of Prime Minister, there seemed to be certain conditions. They did not agree with the conditions of the President. They wanted the President to vacate his post. but. 
shouldn't they have thought about the welfare of the general public as a whole? Do you believe that they well, could have I gone think, about? Well, I think the SJB took sort of a principled position saying that they won't have anything to do mm. or they won't serve under a Gotabe Rajapaksa government. Mm. And therefore, in the end, they came down to saying that, look, if he gives us a timetable saying he's going by such and such a date and that we then move to a timetable for a general election, then we will take part of government. So in that respect, the SJB hasn't sort of sullied or queered the pitch, as it were, as far as they are concerned by wanting to deal with Gotabe Rajpaksa. Now, Ranil Vikramasinghe took the position, we are told, without making any conditions, and his argument is, is that the economy was in such a bad shape that someone should have to step in. Mm. I know this morning, for example, I mean, I tweeted because, you know, there was this whole sense of, you know, law and order going... Uh, going awry and that uh, we could sort of be going into a sheer state of anarchy and said that the opposition parties should all get together and come out and say that they will work with the acting president who has in fact said that look as soon as an interim government is formed that they will that he will resign you know but of course I got a lot of flack in that people sort of said that you know Mr. Vikramasinghe is a proxy for the Rajpaksas and that kind of government is Represent so, Doctor, for, for clarity, uh, for more clarity to, to our viewers, let me just read out your tweet, if that's okay with you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dr. Pakistan Sarvamuthu tweeted earlier today saying that the opposition must work with the acting president to ensure we have at least a semblance of government. Gotabe has to send his letter of resignation and stop his utterly disgraceful prevarication and procrastination. What yeah. was going through your mind when you no, tweeted so this? So, my point was is that, look, you know, him leaving the country and saying that he, Ranil Vikramasinghe, we didn't know that he had actually appointed him at that point when mm. I tweeted that Ranil Vikramasinghe was going to be the uh, acting president. Mm. He could have gone on the never never. He could have been away for months and months and months and still been president of the country. And that was just not acceptable. But at the same time, on the ground, the here, affairs things were falling state. apart. Mm. And so I think, you know, my, my, my sense at that point was mm. is that we can't function without a government we can't go into a situation of absolute anarchy and so to hold the fort with regard to the democratic institutions etc that they should have got together and said look yes we will work together you say you're going Ranil Vikramasinghe says he's going mm. when uh, interim government is formed so okay you're not going to be there forever let's get on with the job Keeping politics aside, let's speak about the responsibility of the people. The people breached the president's house, the official residence, and thereafter they took over the presidential secretariat, pre the president's office in Goldface. However, do you believe the people should exercise a bit more restraint in terms of breaching such uh, institutions? Because these are these are buildings, these are uh, national assets, if I may say that. Do you believe? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think the, you know, the storming, well, the taking over of the president's residence and all of that, I mean, that was like an expression of people's power, that we are the people, we are sovereign, we are the ones that all of this belongs to. You can't do anything without listening to mm -hmm. us. You have to take us into account. What is of concern, of course, is, is that there could well be violent elements within the struggle the Aragale, because it's not one particular homogenous body. That is true. And that has to be kept in check. Mm. The Aragale's great distinction, the, f the, 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 the distinctive feature of it is that it has been peaceful. That it has been fe peaceful, it is operated within the law, and that is what must be upheld. That we have a law, we have constitution, and that we will Whatever we do, we can protest against government, etc., but we will uphold all of that. If we allow all of that to collapse, then we are in a very, very tricky situation. So, Doctor, you spoke about uh, various forces with ulterior motives creeping into the Aragalia to, to, to destroy this peaceful nature that has garnered much attention from even international media for its peacefulness. How does, how can those in the front lines of the Aragale ensure that they weed out those forces? Well, I don't say that there are these forces. This is what I'm told, mm. that there could well be those if forces. If there are. If there are. Mm. And so what, what needs to be done, I think, is, is that perhaps more organization in terms of ensuring that, look, 
this is what we want, these are our demands, and they have presented mm. their demands, and we will operate in the most peaceful and, uh, you know, orderly fashion in order to get that. So I think perhaps greater scrutiny in some sense amongst themselves, sort of self, you know, self-regulation, self self-discipline or whatever it is, so that no one can turn around and say mm. that here was a bunch of anarchists who took over this movement and tried to mm. destroy government and all of that, mm. which will be a terrible violation of what has actually happened. Mm. The Aragala has not been that. It has been extremely peaceful. We're reaching the end of our program. However, I must ask you this, uh, Doctor. Let's talk about accountability. There are people, certain figures, that led to Sri Lanka uh, hitting an all-time low in terms of its economic crisis, the political crisis, society uh, crumbling, the livelihoods of people being lost. How can those people be brought to book? How can justice be meted out? No, so that is why any new government that comes into office must take on accountability and the fight against impunity very seriously prioritize that. Mm. We are party to various international conventions and all of that. We need to operationalize them, implement them and go after it. But I must say this, is that look, you know, Bong Bong Marcos mm. has become the president of the Philippines. The money that his family ha allegedly stole has yet to be brought back. It's only a small fraction. Likewise, well, things have moved on 40 odd years or whatever, and perhaps there are better ways and more efficient ways of recovering it, but I don't think there's a quick fix. So there has to be proper, systematic approach to getting the money back and to holding to account the individuals responsible. And it's not just that, I mean, mm. it's also the accountability with regard to war crimes and the allegations of crimes against humanity. Mm. All of those things have to be addressed. And the UN in Geneva, the UN Human Rights Council, the resolution will expire in September. We must, at the very least, get an extension of that resolution and perhaps even strengthen it. So do you believe uh, reconciliation has taken a back seat amidst all of these crises? It has taken a back seat in terms of the way that we looked at reconciliation before all of this happened. But the Aragalea has not been a sort of majoritarian movement or anything like that. All communities are represented. May not be as wholeheartedly as one would like. And so the questions of transitional justice must also be brought to the fore. Right. In conclusion, Doctor, what would be your message to the people and to those in power? My message to the people in power is to move as fast as possible with regard to the changing of the government. Mm. The interim administration, setting a date for elections, and then a new government coming in with the reform agenda. And the people, I think, particularly the people in the Aragalea, those some of them must actually join politics or form political parties so that we have a much more creative and a much more exciting uh, bunch of people in power who will deal constructively with designing a new social contract for this country. Right. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have tonight on Newsline. We were joined by Dr. Parker Soti Sarwanamuttu, the Executive Director of the Center for Policy Alternatives. So a very eye-opening and engaging discussion. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Doctor, for accepting our invitation and joining us this evening. We now cross over to the Prime Time News. For the News First team, I've been Jaima Ratnaika. Take care, good night, and have yourselves a good day.